Hey everyone, this is the QQ, and this is my recap. This was the week, the one that we'd all been waiting for. As you may notice, this recap's a little bit later than usual, but that's because I'm extending it to cover the weekend. Something very exciting happened last weekend, airplay. So let's go into airplay first, and then I'll cover things that happened earlier in the week afterwards. So Airplay is an event that Michael Koretsky decided to hold. He's the Region 3 Director for the Society of Professional Journalists. He took notice when Gigi was posting in the SPJ Ethics Week hashtag. He managed to wade through all the trolls and shit posting to find some actually intriguing tweets related to the Consumer Revolt, and he decided to give some of the participants of the revolt a platform to air their concerns. On Saturday, August 15th, SPJ Airplay was held in Miami, Florida. There was a morning panel featuring Mark Seb, Ash Scow, and Alan Bakari, with the intent on focusing on the five most egregious ethical issues in games journalism. And then there was an afternoon panel, featuring Kathy Young, Christina Hoff Summers, and Milo Yiannopoulos. The stated purpose of the afternoon panel was to help educate journalists in how to cover internet leaderless consumer revolts. Filling in for the opposite side of the debate were Ren Laforme of the Pointer Institute, Lynn Walsh of the SPJ, and Derek Smart, an indie developer. The morning panel started out with that small 15-minute window to explain what GG was. The panelists tried their best, with Mark Seb taking the lead, but it ended up being quite the daunting task, and the journalists on the opposing panel had some difficulty understanding quite what the Consumer Revolt was all about. The next part was supposed to cover the five most egregious examples of unethical games journalism, but they kind of ran out of time, and they had to cut it short after three. The Max Temkin story, where Kotaku published a poorly sourced and almost slanderous rape accusation against Max Temkin, which was a suspicious accusation in the first place that Max Temkin denied. They also covered Patricia Hernandez, a contributor for Kotaku who had written multiple stories for Kotaku containing conflicts of interest. The final issue that fit in the time slot was the Jeff Gertzman controversy. This was an incident where Jeff Gersman was fired from GameSpot for giving a game a low score while that game was advertising on their site. The opposing panelists admitted that these were journalistic ethics issues. Ren Laform was a little bit dismissive because of how many of the ethical issues were involving Gawker, which he didn't think deserved much repute anyway. Lynn Walsh agreed with that sentiment, saying that she would never quote or cite Gawker, but Derek Smart and the GG panel made it clear that Gawker has quite a large voice in the gaming industry. They're one of the more popular sites on gaming. Yay for audience participation! Game Diviner himself stood up from the audience and helped to explain to the panel how Gawker has tried to destroy lives in the past. I'll give you my own opinion on this after I cover the afternoon panel. Full disclosure, I've been on Hangout streams with Game Diviner before, uh, both before and after the Airplay event. So what of this afternoon panel? What went down there? So apparently there's a little bit of a miscommunication between what the GG Aligned panel thought Koretsky wanted and what Koretsky actually wanted. The three panelists opened with anecdotes. Milo Yiannopoulos brought up the Law & Order SVU episode and the twisted narrative that led to it. Christina Huff Summers brought up the issue of stereotyping. She lamented the fact that when Allison Prime, a body-positive lesbian, lamented the possibility that subreddits about large breasts were going to be deleted from Reddit, that she was stereotyped as being a man, a sexist man, due to her posting on the GG subreddit, Kotaku in Action. Christina Huff Summers also pointed out how a lot of the media narrative was very one-sided, using only one side as a source. Kathy Young pointed out how this was one of the worst covered stories that she'd ever seen. She started to go into statistics on online harassment before Koretsky cut her off. Koretsky wanted to talk about the future and only the future, and about how journalists could cover controversies like this in the future. The panelists insisted that they would need to discuss the past in order to explain what went wrong and how it could be done better. This led to quite a lot of arguing between the two panels and quite a lot of interruptions by Koretsky. There was this rather circular problem where the GG aligned panel would bring up something that needed to be done. The journalists on the other panel, especially Lynn Walsh, would then mention that that's good journalism and that should be being done anyway, to which the GG aligned panel would make statements about how it was not done in this case, and then Koretsky would interrupt and say that they wanted to look towards the future and not talk about the past. The closest that they got to a conclusion was the idea that you might actually want to look at who's active in a hashtag when reporting on a hashtag revolt, and then interview those people. I think that's an okay guideline, but I do think you have to specify that that is specifically the Twitter part of whatever consumer revolt you're talking about. 
This was actually handled quite well by Brad Glasgow when he interviewed Kotaku in action. In his article, he made it clear that all his responses came only from Kotaku in action, and that he was only interviewing that part of the Consumer Revolt. I think it's important to specify which community you talk to, because I've been to many of the communities associated with the events called GG, and they all have a little bit of a different atmosphere about them, and people with slightly different opinions. I mean, there isn't such a large schism that they couldn't get along if they tried. I mean, if they went out for drinks together, they'd have a grand old time. But each community does have its own attitudes and its own opinions, and I don't think any one of them is entitled to speak for all of them. Unfortunately, the debate was cut short with this dramatic announcement. Oh my god, JC, a bomb! A bomb! This was actually the second bomb threat that the audience had been informed of. The first one was shrugged off because it wasn't deemed credible, what with Koretsky's excellent security before, during, and after the event. The second one was considered more credible. I've heard that it was because a specific time was given when the bomb was supposed to go off, and it was reported to both the press and the police, so the police ordered an evacuation. The police were taking it quite seriously. They not only evacuated, but they kept expanding the perimeter, and eventually started evacuating people from their homes. Fortunately, it turned out to be a false threat. Some of the panelists and audience members retreated to a condemned house and continued the debate there. Apparently, this was recorded, and the footage will be uploaded later. So, opinion time! What do I think of SPJ Airplay? So overall, I thought it was pretty fun. The morning panel got off to a slow start, but once it got focused on the ethics issues, it was okay. Derek Smart really helped out with his recentering of things. The afternoon panel was also entertaining until it was ruined by people making stupid threats, but I thought it became especially obvious that what I've been saying this whole time is true. Koretsky seemed to show a clear ulterior motive of trying to make hashtag revolts more easy to cover, not by making journalists better at covering them, but by making hashtag revolts pander more to journalists. This of course means things like having a more formal structure, selecting spokespeople, things that make me cringe a little bit. I thought Lynn Walsh did an excellent job on the opposing panel. Thanks for joining us, Lynn. And I actually understand Ren Laforme's confusion about all of this. And that's because of my biggest regret with regards to airplay, and that is what I consider to be the biggest ethical issue wasn't covered at all. The morning panel didn't really touch on it very much, perhaps due to running out of time, and the afternoon panel almost wasn't allowed to discuss it, with the discussion being recentered on the future every time it was brought up. The issue is, this ethical issue that I'm talking about isn't one that's quite so easily proved, easily quantified as things like conflicts of interest, but it's the one that people are really passionate about. It's the one that has kept this thing going all this time. Look, I've been trying to do something really hard for months now, and that is take all these conflicts of interest that are being found, all the things that prove that there's a click, and make them more palatable, make them more presentable, make them entertaining. It's not easy work. And you may have noticed that just about all of the other YouTubers have given up on doing this. I would say that if you get most of your GG news from YouTubers, you're not caught up on all the conflicts of interest that have been found. There's that whole messy tangle of financial relationships that makes up critical distance. And then there's all the issues that are coming out involving Tale of Tales and their game Sunset. These are huge ethical issues. I mean, obvious conflicts of interest. And in some cases, they're considerably worse than what Nathan Grayson or Patricia Hernandez did. And even those involved in the Consumer Revolt who claim that they're solely focused on ethics seem to not put their money where their mouth is with regards to these things. So how can a revolt like this over ethical issues be sustained if no one's talking about the most recent ethical issues. And actually, I have seen people pack up and leave. They believe that all the ethical issues are solved due to the presence of ethics policies at some sites. They haven't noticed that there's huge ethical issues that have been found in 2015, and some of them quite recently. The thing is what upset most people, the big ethical issue isn't something quite as objective as a conflict of interest. That's why Ren Laform was so confused. I mean, it's not like people usually get this passionate about conflicts of interest, but I think Game Diviner, when he stood up to talk, was almost directly on point. I say almost because it didn't quite hit the nail right on the head in my view. It did give it a hearty smack, though. Game Diviner brought up how, even though Gawker is of ill repute, it still has the power to ruin lives. 
I would take it a step further and say that it's not just that Gawker and the like like to smear people. I would say that if these publications, and I'm not just talking clickbait publications, I mean The Guardian too, if they get a narrative in mind that they want to push, well, then they have the power and they have no qualms about pushing it, even if that means excluding facts, omitting facts, or altering facts. Look how much of the coverage of GG contained complete fabrications or omitted important facts. Now, we can't say for sure if this was intentional, but it certainly wasn't ethical. Basically, what I think was happening was this. Large chunks of the press decided that they were going to perform activism instead of journalism in this case. I mean, it's practically amateur critical theory bullshit. Writing with the intent to change the world for the better instead of the intent of telling the truth. And their views of ethics are very much based around the ends justify the means. To them, ethical journalism is journalism that pushes the right agenda. You can see this in blog posts that predate GG, with this particular blogger lamenting that people like JonTron and Total Biscuit don't have any journalistic ethics because they don't push a progressive agenda. So basically, we had a bunch of people who wanted to write a little piece about misogyny and geek culture, specifically in gaming. They wrote their stories by picking facts selectively, by interviewing only the right people who would say the right things. And then to top it off, they needed a cute little catchphrase, a thought-terminating cliché, you could say, a little buzzword. Maybe you could call it a political dog whistle because it was a word that when they said it, they wanted their in-group to instantly think of all those misogynists in the gaming community. Trying to use the word gamer for this purpose didn't work so well. So why not kill two birds with one stone? They could remove a major thorn from their side by borrowing a name for a bunch of journalistic scandals and a consumer revolt. Namely, they could just use the word Gamergate. And then it was suddenly like Jessica Valenti was working for every publication at once. They all published these opinion pieces that had horrible and provable factual issues as if they were news about the gaming community. And because the bullshit in the gaming press is usually more covert, the mainstream media picked up on it and reported it verbatim. If the mainstream media did any more research, they just interviewed exactly the same people that the gaming press did. So most of this was initially based off the word of a very small handful of people. And that in and of itself is an ethical issue. If you're only interviewing one person on a topic, well, that's not right. When this happened with Wizard Chan, then editor-in-chief of The Escapist, Greg Tito, had to apologize for it. That's how much of an ethical issue it was. So that's why only Ren LaForme is laughing when we're talking about these ethical issues. Yes, a few conflicts of interest might seem like something petty, but when you've been lied about and smeared in the press for a year, almost non-stop, and with no apology in sight, well then, you might start to understand why these people are so passionate about journalistic ethics. If I had to give advice to journalists on how to cover something like GG, it's actually pretty simple. Step one, understand the internet, and step two, do your job. Remember that David Arbach had no issue covering GG accurately and factually, even though his article was about how to put a stop to it. And this is because he understood the internet he did his research, and he did his job. So the morning panel didn't have time to talk about this or didn't broach the subject. And the afternoon panel wasn't allowed to talk about this. It's almost like they didn't want to discuss the issue of widespread press narratives leaking into the mainstream media. Well, oh well. I don't need positive coverage to keep doing what I'm doing. And the people who are digging, they don't need positive coverage to keep doing what they're doing either. So here's to season two of GG, where Vox is the new Gawker, Critical Distance is the new Silver String Media, and Skype and Facebook are the new Game Journal pros. While we're on the subject of Critical Distance, Carly Smith wrote this article in Pace Magazine. It's about Life is Strange and its depictions of mental health. Carly Smith also gives money to Critical Distance on Patreon. I bet you know where this is going. Sure enough, surprising nobody at all, here's an article in cooperation with Critical Distance published on Gamma Sutra. It's written by Johnny Kill Hefner. Now, before we go any further, take a little gander at that date. May 18th, 2015. This is well after when GG supposedly won. Remember when all those sites added ethics policies? And just as we suspected, this article in Gamma Sutra in cooperation with Critical Distance 
You know, the critical distance that Carly Smith is paying money to references her Paste Magazine article and links to it right here without any disclosure whatsoever. So just remember, these ethical issues kept happening all the way into 2015. Aren't you glad somebody's still looking into these things? And that somebody would be Boogie Pop Robin, who did the original research on this. Remember folks, I'm just the messenger, it's the diggers who do all the hard work. So welcome to the tidbit section, where we cover all the smaller headlines. So some bad news. Some of the sites that some of you may be using as part of the rebuild initiative ran into some trouble. First of all, TechRaptor had been using Gratapay as a way to get funding from its fans. As part of the migration process to Gratapay 2.0, their application was rejected. One of the reasons given was because they require people to apply in order to write for TechRaptor. They weren't an open work, which is a requirement for Gratapay 2.0. But the reason that caught everyone's attention was that they were denied because they identify with the Gamergate slash anti-Gamergate conflict. That apparently clashed too strongly with the Gratapay brand identity. The founder of Gratapay, Chad Whitaker, made a bizarre response to the article calling them out. I think what he's trying to say is that news sites like TechRaptor, when reporting on controversies like GG, are more likely to feed the controversy, then reconcile the controversy. Since reconciliation is part of Gratapay's values or whatever, that was part of the cause to reject them. To me, these values just seem worded vaguely so that they can be interpreted in a selective manner. TechRaptor themselves brought up this vagueness in a follow-up article where they mentioned that it was an obstacle to constructive dialogue. Niche Gamer is also running into trouble, what with Google suspending their AdSense. I'll keep you posted as this one develops. After getting blocked by the OSCON official Twitter account, David Arbach decided to write an article on the various block lists on Twitter. He discusses their pros and cons in a pretty fair manner. In the latter part of the article, he discusses some of the problems with them, like how these block lists are getting so big that the people who make them don't know why everyone who's on them is on them, about how using them is somewhat of an endorsement of the criteria that the block lists are created with, about how some of the block list criteria is hidden, and you might not even know why people are on it, and how sharing block lists promotes the exclusion of a person, which is a social statement, not a personal decision. So wouldn't it be a little bit unusual if this mild of an article attracted the attention of multiple C-level executives on Twitter? The first one, Dash, the CEO of Makerbase, accused Arbok of undermining and weakening the tools used to prevent abuse. Head of XOXO Fest, Andy Bio, proclaimed that Arbok was a pro-GG troll, and therefore his placement on the block list was legitimate. So Arbok was not okay with this. Not at all. And it didn't make him any more happy when the two of them went around playing the victim. The statements that they had made about Arbok were false, and they were powerful people in the tech community. Bio did eventually apologize to Arbok, but Dash did not apologize and slunk off into the shadows, causing Arbok to call him out for a previous tweet that Dash had made in favor of the practice of doxing. Oh, well would you look at that. Look at who Dash is talking about doxing with. Anyway, for such a mild article to get such a big reaction from such powerful people shows that Arbok's publishing some pretty powerful works. And finally, 8chan was removed from Google due to people reporting it for child abuse content, despite the fact that that's against 8chan's rules and is removed when reported. The article about it in The Observer claimed that 8chan was a gathering place for some of the internet's worst, including pedophiles and gamergators. <laughs> yeah, they use those two in the same sentence. So that concludes the recap for the first half of August. Thanks for joining us. Remember, if you liked what you see, remember to subscribe and share this around. I'll see you again later. Ciao!